Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Estimates, forecasting with Little's Law. And we've got Todd Little to explain it to us. So thanks a lot, Todd, for joining us today. All right. Over to you, Todd, then. So welcome to Beyond Estimating, forecasting with Little's Law. Um, I'm Todd Little. I'm chairman of Kanban University, and I'm going to be leading you through some um, what I find particularly interesting perspective on estimations and, and how we can apply things like Little's Law. So what is Little's Law? Um, little, uh, it's not mine. Um, my, my law, or I have lots of laws, but they're not this one. Uh, this is John D.C. Little, who's uh, no known relation. So John D.C. Little is, is involved in queuing theory, uh, looking at how, how long things take on, in going through queues, and um, looked at it and came up with this perspective that the average number of customers in the system over some interval is equal to their average arrival rate multiplied by their average time in the system. So the average length of the QL is equal to the average arrival rate uh, times the average wait time. A fairly straightforward uh, perspective, and uh, it's proven to be quite valuable and quite useful in looking at the relationship of, of these, three, three, the, these three variables. What we have found uh, frequently in what we're looking at in, in uh, uh, delivery of knowledge work uh, is this frequently is reformed as the average delivery rate is equal to average work in progress divided by the average lead time. And if you think about it, it's basically it's, it's a rate equation, right? It's, it's going back to high school or even uh, you know, before uh, algebra uh, looking at uh, the slope of the line, the throughput, average arrival, average departure rate, uh, is equal to, you know, the average number of, is the, the rise, the work in progress of the average number of customers um, over the time in system or the average lead time. Now, there's a number of assumptions that are, that are in Little's Law in order to, to make it work. Um, one is that the average arrival rate is equal to the average departure rate, which is to say that we are, whatever's coming in the system is actually going out the system and the pace at which it's entering the system is fairly consistent um, with the pace that it's going out of the system. So we have a steady state flow. Very important, very important base, base assumption. Um, we assume that the tasks entering the system will eventually exit the system. Uh, otherwise, we would not be having the same um, arrival and departure rate. Um, we're not expecting large variances in work in progress between the beginning of the or the end of time period examined. Um, the average age should be about the same, neither increasing nor decreasing. And of course, we need to be using consistent units uh, throughout to measure cycle time, whip, and throughput. Some fairly core assumptions, but if we, if we stand by those core assumptions, it turns out to be quite a useful tool. It tells us a couple of things. One is that it tells us the relationship of what happens if we were to reduce, if we were to work with reducing work in progress, for example. Suppose we reduce our work in progress for the same throughput, we would expect to get a reduction in lead time, as you see. And this is a fairly important concept that we use in the Kanban world of why we, why we limit our work in progress. Because if we can limit work in progress, we can get things through the system faster. They don't stay in the system. Um, and that's if, the, that's if the throughput stays the same. Now, me, most of the time, what we find when we have uh, overwork situations uh, is that there's so much multitasking and other things going on that actually throughput increases. Now, that's not specifically part of Little's Law. It's just something that we found in the Kanban world is another reason why limiting work in progress is good because it, it reduces multitasking and other issues. But the core things of Little's Law are quite useful. Um, the other thing we look at when we, in the, in the Kanban world in particular, but I think also other places, is looking at a cumulative flow diagram. And the nice thing about this cumulative flow diagram, since it's tracking our delivery, our arrival rates and departure rates um, over time, is that we get, um, we can imply Little's Law essentially from the, the uh, cumulative flow diagram. The average lead time is the horizontal distance between the arrival and the, the uh, delivery. Um, the average work in progress is the is the um, um, is the vertical distance between the two, and the the average delivery rate or average throughput um, is the slope of the line. And despite all the, the assumption restrictions that I mentioned earlier, um, this formula is 
proven quite useful uh, for understanding how flow systems behave as you change WIP. And what we have found is that it's, if, if we have this steady state, we can actually, actually use the, the average delivery rate as a means of um, predicting and forecasting um, how our deliveries will continue. So we look at that and we say, hmm, that's interesting, you know, but where are the estimates there? And what you'll see is there, we generally don't be, uh, in, in the little law requires to have sizing and estimates in order to, to make use of this. So where are the estimates? So, so we don't usually have estimates here. We're, we're basically assuming that, that um, uh, we can track based on um, the assumptions of little law that, that this is working. Does it really work, right? Um, so this is an exercise I won't do I, uh, with you, but I, I, I'm going to show what I've I frequently do is I, I, I look at, uh, when I'm looking at estimates, I, I bring around this jar of, of jelly beans and, and have a group estimate them. And I'm going to just show you the, the exercise I do. And, and uh, I've run this example enough times that I know what the results will be. So I'll just share that later. But we're, we're sort of obsessed with estimation. And one of the things we think we're, we think we're much better estimators than we actually are. Um, we, and uh, you know, this is an example I use to, to demonstrate that. I'll come back to it later. Um, and, and we're so obsessed with estimation that I think we consider a major part of our job to either create estimates or deliver against someone else's estimates. This is, has been ingrained in, in the way, and particularly in the software world, you know, we need estimates. They give us my estimates. Um, so the challenge is it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. So when, when we're, we're in a business where we're, we're thinking, oh, we have to work against estimates, um, it becomes very emotional. So let's let's uh, let's look at what actually the case is uh, regarding how good we are. At, you know, why are we estimating? What are we using those estimates for? And which are the ones which make sense, and which ones maybe don't make sense? So basically, it comes down to decisions. What sort of decisions are we making? You know, early on at the very beginning, we're making a decision to sanction the project or not. You know, we're overall looking at a, at a, at a gross perspective on, you know, what's the cost? What's the value? Um, do we have the right investment in order to make this? So, so macro level estimation is, is something that's, that's happening. It's a decision point. Do we do it or not? As we steer towards the release, this is where we're making, you know, are we doing, are we on target to meet, meet whatever commitments we ha may have made? And what might we be able to do about that? And then in the case of Scrum, for example, we're trying to determine in the tactical sense, can we manage our iterations, right? Are we making our iteration commitment or our capacity? These are questions frequently made in, in Scrum. You know, in, in the Kanban world, you may or may not be making these types of considerations. What is it that we estimate? Um, you know, for the release, we're looking at duration, effort, cost. Um, frequently, this is in, in more of a, a scrum world. We're looking at story pointing and t-shirt sizing, um, stories looking at story points, and, and, and then those that do it um, uh, for a, a task, looking more at hours type of thing. Um, and and what, is our, what is the challenges we typically face um, in estimation? Let me go ahead and um, I'm just gonna skip this one because we've, it's, we've got some technical difficulties getting sound to come across. So the, the point of the, the, the talk today is to look at, can we use Little's Law for forecasting? Can we essentially discontinue estimating story points since we don't require them in, in our formulation with Little's Law, and instead, instead simply count the number of completed stories per time period and forecast using a burn up or burn down based on throughput, uh, i.e. we use Little's Law. How would that work? So we collected and analyzed some real data, um, something we did, I did with a partner, Chris Verhoff, a few years back. Um, and we looked at some data collected by uh, Vasco Duarte. He had 55 projects from nine companies, and the data is there in the, in the link. Um, and if just so you have the definition when I'm going through things, when I'm talking about velocity, I'm looking at story points delivered in an iteration, uh, or average total points delivered over all iterations. And we're talking throughput. It's the number of stories delivered over a period of time and the average total number of stories delivered over all time. So if we just use throughput and Little's Law to forecast completion, is it any more or less accurate than using velocity, any story points? So first, we have to go back to the basic burnup. What's our basic burnup chart looking like? We have 
uh, chart here. In this case, what I've normalized down to um, uh, zero to one, so a percentage of time uh, on the bottom and the percentage done on the top. And we start our work done on the on the system, and we start burning up the amount of uh, stories. Our velocity then, our average velocity can be calculated based on what we've done so far uh, over the time so far, and then we can extrapolate it out. And based on this extrapolation, um, we can see when we think we're going to be done with it. Now, had this been a perfect perfect data, we would have been extrapolating out uh, to the to the one one uh, coordinate, but uh, it's not perfect, so we're off a little bit. That's fine. That's expected a little bit. So this is what we're seeing from a basic burnout. Now, if we plot multiple of them for story points, uh, this is just some some um, samples of um, uh, from the data set, first three the first three projects in the data data collection. Uh, this is sort of the typical thing we see uh, for story points uh, for a story points uh, system. Now, how does it look if we add throughput? So if we look at throughput instead, it turns out we get something very similar. There's not a lot of difference here for this from the from the trained, you know, from the untrained eye or even trained eye. It looks pretty much the same. So initially, it looks like, hey, this may not, this may work, right? We've got uh, we can use throughput maybe and get the same type of thing. Um, but we want to look deeper than that. We want to look to do a little bit more statistical analysis of how things actually are looking. Uh, just an Additional item out here, we realized that we saw a number of, when this data set, it was a fairly common behavior for there to be sort of a hardening phase um, of, of, 10, of 2 to 12 percent uh, at the end of the, uh, for about 50 percent of the project. So they weren't at the point where they had completely um, uh, eliminated the need for, for some sort of a, a end state. So just an interesting tidbit that came out of the data. So now we're going to go with just a little bit of statistics. I'm going to try to make it as, as uh, uh, you know, not go deep into it, but just the, some of the very basics. Um, the reality is that, that anything is a, a probability distribution. When we're looking at how long things are going to take, it's a probability distribution. And this is a fairly typical distribution type of curve that we see, just using it for reference. And the thing is, it's, it's showing a probability of, of what things may be uh, over time. And typically what we find is our, you know, that in, when we're looking at, at uh, complex work is that they tend to be skewed a little bit to the right side. So not going into deep depth right now, but you'll see some numbers like P10, P90. Uh, what does that mean? So P10 and P90 are terms that are commonly used, not so much within our industry, but within other industries. I come from oil and gas. It's very common, commonly used. It's also used for, for um, uh, wealth distribution, to, uh, looking at sort of what's the ratio between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. So P, P10, P90 means uh, 10th percentile, 90th percentile, or probability of 90 percent, probability of 10 percent. If we look at a collection of data here, we've got 10 data points. And we sort them out. You can look at the P90 is not the, the, the extreme, and the P10 is not the extreme, but one, one up and one down from the extreme. So we have a 12 and a 2, and the ratio of the P9, the P90 to P10, the ratio here is 12 over 2 uh, or 6. OK, pretty straightforward. And we're look, the reason we do this, we don't really want the extremes. We, we want a good thing that tells us the band of the data we're looking at, but we're not looking at the extremes. So we're looking in, in a wealth distribution world, we'd be looking at people like lawyers and doctors uh, relative to people maybe at a minimum wage. But we're not looking at, at the extremes, which would be um, beggars or perhaps um, the filthy rich. I mean, this is not the type of this. We're not looking at extremes. We're looking at sort of the 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 um, the high and low, but not the extremes. And it gives us a good indication of the span of the data. So in this case, the span is six. Okay, which means yeah. So ranging from two to twelve. If we look at in in what we're predicting out, we can also look at. Given where we're at, and we can do some, you know, perhaps do some uh, evaluation of it, you know, and we do some forecasting, what's our 10% confidence and what's our 90% confidence? So in this case, perhaps, we may have six months as our best case, or, or our 10th percent probability of being successful in, in six months, 90% uh, successful being 12 months or less, uh, in this case, a P90 to P10 of two, okay? 
So let's move on. So I told you I would come back to this. Well, what, what type of things do we see when I actually run this exercise of, of estimating the number of jelly beans? And what I see fairly consistently uh, in this case, about a, P6, a P10 of about 60 um, and a P90 of about 360, which gives us a ratio of a P90 to P10 of about six. And you know, it's fairly consistently in the range of four to six in this P90 to P10 ratio. And why do I do this? I do this because most people would expect the estimates to be much more of narrow bandwidth than this, much more narrow band. Um, and so it exposes them to the fact that our estimation capability, even for something simple as jelly beans, is actually a, a pretty wide range, uh, quite a wide range. And, and the fact is that estimating jelly beans ought to be a whole lot easier than, because we can see it, than, than doing something like estimating how long uh, knowledge work will take. Uh, knowledge work is much more complex, much more dimensionality to it than just a simple uh, visual 3D, three-dimensional uh, image here. So we don't, we're not so good at, at, at estimating. Maybe if we use the data, we could get better. We can use, use um, uh, it to help us forecast. So as we go on, here's, here's the type of thing we did. We looked at the data and we looked at how accurate, given the data, the 55 projects, what sort of ranges did we have? between our P90 and P10. And this is just an example here, again, to re, uh, first, before we do that, re-emphasize what we're doing. We took data at various time points, say, example, at, at the 30% um, completion point, we might have something like a P90 of 1.5 and a P10 of 0.6. Um, if you feel more comfortable multiplying, you can multiply that out by 10 and say, well, 15 months or six months, uh, remaining uh, to be done, or uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, uh, 15 months or six months come total time. But what we're really looking at is how much is remaining. So we subtract off the third, the the um, the three months, and we end up with uh, 1.2 over 0.3, or a P90 to P10 of four. So the, since we're looking at a forecast, we're looking at how long it's going to be from this point forward, and that's what we we used in our reporting. So when we looked at the data, we discovered that velocity and throughput provide comparable accuracy in forecasting release dates. So the ranges of the P90 to the P10 for velocity and throughput were almost, almost identical, right around the four range. Um, and sometimes throughput was a little bit better. Sometimes velocity was a little bit better. It was inconclusive as to, you know, was one better than the other, based statistically inconclusive. You're basically getting the same information through the, the throughput forecast as we got from a velocity forecast. So that's an interesting insight that we had from the data. Um, and then the question we asked, do we get better at estimating the further we go into pro into a project? I mean, does our velocity become more stable over time? Does it, be, does it increase? And in fact, um, no, velocity predictability does not get better over time. We aren't getting better estimators. We aren't getting better predictability of velocity. And so a lot of the things people say, well, velocity is going to get better over time, it doesn't show up in the data that we had. Um, in fact, it actually, to a certain extent, gets worse. Our predictability goes down. As you can see, that the, the solid red line is going up. So this is what means our range of our predictability is, is getting higher, meaning our predictability is lower. Um, some other conclusions from the data. So first of all, I think pretty important story point estimations didn't provide us any improvement in predictive power over just counting stories. Um, pretty important uh, insight. And velocity and throughput both showed high variance um, and that variance did not decrease over time. It actually increased, um, which means that, that uh, you know, the, the thing I think we frequently count on in, in, uh, is these hopeful things that just turn out to not be the case. Um, so the reality here is that given what we've seen in data, it says that throughput using Little's law is actually every bit as good as trying to do a much, you know, going through the, the, the task of, of, um, of estimating uh, the, the stories and, um, and, and getting no additional value. Uh, then we like to mention there's this hardening phase we saw, which is something we can take into account as well. And, and you know, while throughput is as good a predictor as velocity, uh, neither is a fantastic pred uh, predictor, right? We're not going to magically be able to get answers that are, that are uh, accurate. Um, what we can do is understand what a range is and, and manage that range accordingly. 
so our P10, P90 to P10 ratio is, uh, if we use the forecasting approach using throughput, is about 3.5. I just roughly saying that if, if our forecasting is out, uh, forecasting out six months remaining, then the P10 to P90 bands would basically be from uh, 3.2 months to about 11.2 months. So, you know, you have to tune this for your own situation, but this is just the indication. This is about as good as we're going to get. And you, you, you're in, in, uh, in terms of being able to predict uh, and the and going through a, a detailed estimation activity uh, doesn't help that phase, that doesn't help that based on the data. So we said, look, at that's what we found in the data. <laughs> What, what would we find, you know, is there a way we could model this from a simulation perspective uh, and using, using a simulation, can we get a similar, can we match the data first? And then based on, uh, once we've matched the data, can we explore the range of when might it work, when might uh, it be worthwhile to, to estimate? Uh, so we start in with how our stories are coming in. So we, the, the, uh, the, we have a range of distributions of our a probability of distribution for our, our story point. But remember, story points are not size. Story points are estimated size. Uh, estimates are not accurate. So we have to look at and multiply that by a distribution of estimation accuracy. So a combination of these two distributions can then be fed into a Monte Carlo engine and gives us a distribution of projections coming out, which we look at the difference between what velocity would tell us and what throughput would tell us. And what we find is that uh, we can simulate, we can come up with a simulation that produces results quite similar to the measured data. So we, we can tune that, basically feed the data back in from the, the real data, run it through the simulation, and, and uh, the simulation models quite, quite accurately uh, what the original uh, data showed. So we, say, we have decent confidence that we can match the existing data. Let's now start looking at expanding that. When do we see uh, you know, if we if we make larger, dist uh, wider distributions with higher P90 to P10 ratios or narrower distributions where we have very much more either much more higher accuracy or uh, similar size stories, what difference would that make? Um, so what if um, we start looking at, you know, at the observed data, throughput and velocity give nearly identical results with Within, in the actual data, throughput was slightly better than velocity. Okay, but that's, I think that's a, uh, statistically, this, I would say statistically, they're roughly the same. They're, they're no, there's nothing to indicate that one was better, but if you actually looked at the raw numbers, you could make a clue, oh, throughput is slightly better than velocity. So our estimates actually made things worse. Um, but if we do look at the simulations, um, if we look at the simulations, we found that they're, about the, that they're about the same. And actually, probably in the simulations, velocity is just a, is, is a tad bit better, um, but, but not by much. Not enough to make it worth, you know, in general, to feel like it was worth, worth the, uh, the effort going on into it. So what if we have a large distribution in story size? What is the impact of that? Well, if we have a very, very large distribution in story size, then it did show that velocity is better. So there is a point at which, you know, if you, you have a huge distribution uh, difference in story size, then it's, it's better. If you have what's probably considered a normal, uh, a more um, regular distribution in story size, where your stories are about the same, or, you know, maybe ranging in, in the, uh, size from a one to a 10, it's probably not going, it's not going to help that much. Uh, the, the throughput will be just as good. Um, what if we're really good at estimation? What if our estimation range is, is very tight? Well, it turns out that if this is the case, it actually helps both throughput and velocity, right? So, so um, uh, what it means is you're, it's, so it turns out it really doesn't matter um, in, in this case. It does make the overall prediction better, um, which is great, but um, it's not the answer. It's not the panacea. To get great at estimation is not the panacea. And I think it's probably actually not, not doable as well. Not, I've looked at a lot of estimation data and the reality is that despite our, our amount of effort we've put into trying to get better at a priori estimation, you know, estimating prior to, to the date, to the delivery, um, the ranges, the P90 to P10 is consistently upwards of, of four, um, which means you know about the same as our jelly bean exercise, and at that level, um, it's not helping us. It's not adding information uh, value to our decision-making process. Uh, utilizing throughput and forecasting based on throughput 
is a, as good and pr probably um, uh, more valuable because it's actually forcing us to be living by the data rather than forcing it, than putting us into a mode where we're, we're looking at um, uh, wishes and hopes. Um, we also took a quick look at you know, did it make a difference whether we used um, Fibonacci or, or types or um, uh, bucket sizes of two uh, in the in the estimation, and it turns out that that didn't really impact anything. So you, if you're do, if you're finding yourself that you still want to be doing estimates and you want to be using using things like um, you know, you're planning poker Fibonacci sequence or buckets of power of two, uh, it's fine. It doesn't it's none of it, it doesn't hurt you. It doesn't help you. So what does it tell us? If we're, you know, the story I look at is if we're estimating some mixed nuts, um, I don't really care whether I have some, you know, whether I'm not going to try to look at the difference between peanuts and cashews and Brazil nuts. Uh, that doesn't matter. But what I do care about is I want to find if I've got any coconuts, right? The big things are the things which will impact us. But if I've got a pretty um, a reasonable distribution, my little law forecasting is going to be perfectly acceptable as long as the other characteristics are are there. Now, it turns out a lot of the characteristics, a lot of the assumptions of Little's Law are exactly the same types of assumptions you'd need for velocity to work. Um, the only one that's really different is that of in velocity, we think we can, we can have information to add by estimating story points. And what we find in general, that's probably not going to be the case. Uh, the other thing the simulations tell us is if I do have coconuts, then I should see, can I split those into, into smaller nuts? Is there a way to do that? And usually they're Usually those are the cases that we uh, frequently, and particularly in knowledge work, particularly in software development, uh, it's rare that we, we actually can only work on a coke event as a whole. We usually can split it down, and that splitting is a good idea. What other things did it tell us about estimation? Um, that, that decisions to steer, when we're looking at decisions to steer towards the release, that velocity and throughput are equally good and equally bad predictors. And, um, but there's nothing, you know, it's, but it's better than nothing. So it is something that can help us uh, I mean, making use of velocity, understanding how scope is, is and, and, and working it at um, uh, the, the, the scope line, the velocity line where they intersect. Perfectly valid, look at velocity. You can also look at throughput the same way. And, um, they're both useful tools, and they're, they're, they, but they do have their limitations, so that's where you want to make use of, of understanding what those limitations are. Um, what does it tell us about um, decisions helping with, with iterations? I mean, my view is that, that given that story points don't help us much, um, I don't think that the task estimations are adding any value either, um, because I think it's solving the wrong problem. It's not solving the high level problem, which is 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 uh, what business decisions are you actually making? So um, and and part of this is is that you know in, the, in a Kanban world we don't usually have iterations, and we're not really trying to meet some particular um, what might be considered an artificial deadline. So um, I think the value add of task estimations is quite, is quite low. You know, we're, we're basically, once we've decided we're going to do a story, we're going to do it. Why, why bother um, with estimating once you've, made, once you've already made that decision? What does it tell us about macro estimation, decisions at project sanction? Um, some level of macro estimation of costs and benefits is likely necessary uh, for your business decisions. So you know you're going to have to have some degree of you're, you're making a decision up front. You hey, you have no data really to start from. You're going to have to probably have some level of a macro estimate. But it, but I think trying to um, but it's just going to be a macro estimate. You shouldn't be spending more time on on uh, estimating cost than you spend on estimating the value. Uh, it's just um, and it's just, and if it's a guarantee, if it's a decision is I'm going to do this regardless. You shouldn't be bothering uh, with estimates at all. So just to look, you know, how does this look to other research? Um, just quickly, um, I did a, a um, uh, an article in IEEE Software based on data in my company, Landmark Graphics, back um, in uh, uh, 2000, it published in 2006, where I was looking particularly at, at uh, estimation accuracy and, and uh, how it related also to the cone of uncertainty. Um, just on a high level perspective, if we'd looked at, at things that what is sort of the range of, of uh, uh, that we're looking at, a range of data, if I looked at the actual versus initial estimate, my data looked much like this, um, uh, scattered. And um, the, the, I also compared this to other data from uh, Tom DeMarco that he had published. It looked very similar. When I, you know, so I said, this, this is looking like we've got some trends that are fairly common uh, in our industry. Uh, the P90 to P10 ratio of this data was about four to one. So you know, fairly common, same type of thing we see all the time. 
Uh, the data from Steve McConnell, similar. You know, we're we're not only are we sc high scatter, but we're also quite optimistic. Very low, below, almost nothing below the line. Uh, almost all the data points have a longer completion than than the uh, than the estimate. So if we look at you know 10% probability of you know if we really looked at how good are we with estimating, this is sort of the state of the industry in terms of estimating for software development. Um, 10 to 20% chance of delivering on time. And if we wanted to have a 90% chance of delivering on time, we'd be needing to, to look at four times that. Um, so this is where we're at. And, and uh, the, the thing that we can make use of with Little Law, so Little Law is going to give us a little bit better, little slight, you know, in this range or, or better, but what it's doing is taking advantage of our real data. It's also debiasing it because once, once we, um, you know, with, op with estimation, we have this tend to be an optimism bias. And, and um, with Little's Law, it takes that optimism bias away from us. It basically relies on the data to tell us how things are going uh, rather than our optimistic projection. Um, this is a great um, study that uh, Mungne Jorgensen did in 2013. And I love this one because this is the first time I've seen a situation where they actually not only had estimates done, but actually had work done um, by six different vendors. So six different vendors uh, well, 16 initial estimates, six bidders actually did the software delivery as well. So we have data both on the estimate and on the, the delivery. Um, and it turns out the range between the highest and lowest estimate was about eight to one. Uh, the actual range, the actual overestimate range uh, went from slightly better. So there was one case where, where they did better than uh, the estimate. So it actually took less, which is quite rare. Um, but that range between the low and the high was about four to one. Um, and um, actually, interesting thing is that the lowest bid actually came in under their bid. So it was just an interesting tidbit. And the actual performance range, uh, the worst case, took 18 times the effort of the best. These are the types of realities we face um, in, in our in our work in software, um, in knowledge work. And um, you know, so I think that that's why we can make use of things. Um, you know, take advantage of Little's Law. So can Little's Law really work in practice, right? How, how do we, so here, here's an example of, of a, a case of the company that I was at. Um, and what you see here is that they, they had been, they, they went to approach, you know, basically usually utilizing this because they had been struggling and struggling and struggling with estimates. It was taking so much time and they weren't really feeling like they were getting getting any progress. So instead, what they started to do, let's not worry about estimate. Let's just get things started. Let's start working on things. And once we start working on things, let's see how the trends are showing. So what they saw was that they had a situation like this, the blue line and the um, uh, the orange line. And this, you know, so what they're seeing is their scope is growing as fast as they're delivering. In fact, it's even getting, it's even getting worse. So you can make a very clear assess assessment here and say, I got a problem. If this continues, we're never going to get done. So what did they do? They started looking at, well, what if we improve some things a little bit? And they think the, the best they could hope for to improve got them up to this, this um, uh, green extended line. They're still not going to uh, make, uh, make things work. So they need to make some decisions. What did they do? They said, OK, we're going to squeeze down hard on the scope and we're going to add some people to the project. And basically, that's going to be the means by which we can can help this come together. And eventually, that's what happened. They made some decisions, and those and that's what we're trying to use estimates. What are the things we need to? What are the actions we need to take? And the Little's Law uh, provided that type of capability quite well in this situation to help look at that um, where things are at, what are the decisions, and how do we we steer that appropriately. Uh, so this is my contact information uh, that's available. Happy to reach out to you know to to uh, discuss any of this or or other things with you um, at any point in time. And I think we've got just a few minutes left for uh, for some Q and A. Right. So the first question is, uh, what is the best way to balance the rate of delivery to demand? Ah, uh, okay. Well, a couple of things. Um, one is. Um, and so Kanban is the right answer to this. <laughs> That's what we do in Kanban. Kanban, and we try to make sure that we've got consistency of flow. And a lot of it's, it's sort of essential to a central part of what we do. Uh, we try to balance. We try to look at um, limiting WIP in order to make sure that what we are working on um, is going to actually make it through the system. So um, 
and and the it doesn't it, we might have things backed up before a commitment point. The, the, once we do what in the Kanban, we have what we call a commitment point, and when we commit to a commitment is the point at which we've got agreement that yes, uh, this is a piece of work that we agree that we want to deliver, and we agree that we will deliver it. And so we keep things uh, limited in the in the pipeline. And by limiting things in the pipeline, uh, that gives us the means by which to get predictability. So it's all about um, maintaining flow, uh, consistency of flow. If we can get to a system where we have consistency of flow, um, we can have that balance. And so there's a lot of capability, a lot of tools that we have in Kanban for, for helping that. Um, various things, uh, various parts of it where we can potentially uh, shape the demand coming in or or um, uh, make adjustments to the system in order to uh, increase our delivery rate. But yes, getting it in balance is key, and, and, and that's what gives us increased predictability. Okay, that's great. Uh, this one's interesting by Sri Devi. What estimation model would you suggest for the macro or the initial estimation that we do when the Scrum team is not there yet? Yeah, so so that's really a biz, That's really a decision at the at the business level, um, and so it's it's a it's a um, it's a high level perspective. Um, you know, I I think that we know we're going to be off in both our. The, the key thing about that initial um, assessment is we have to realize, um, you know, we're going to be way off on both our value estimation and on our sizing estimation. But what ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, is make a go no go decision. Um, the problem is that frequently what happens is once that early estimate is made, it gets cast in stone, and and that becomes problematic. Um, so the approach I would say is is that it doesn't matter too much what approach is used. I don't I don't think a detailed analysis, you know, a a, a, a work breakdown structure or any type of, of approach like that is is justified um, because the there's no similar type of activity like that done on the value side. So there's no point in making that estimation activity on the cost side any higher degree of fidelity than than is done on the value side. And we know how to do it. We, we've done it on the value side. It oftentimes is a gut feel. Um, and that's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with you know, companies need to learn how to do that. I don't think we have a um, particular magic bullet, and there is no magic bullet. We've been at this, this, um, you know, trying to get better at estimation for 50 years, and fundamentally, things have not changed drastically in 50 years. Um, the, the ranges of estimation is pretty much the same, which tells me it's diminishing returns to, to a large extent, trying to get a, a huge degree better. But what we have gotten better at is getting more predictable systems, and and that's the type of thing that agility helps us with. But is it can help us with? It's certainly the thing that Kanban tries to drive for is, is increasing predictability, um, but utilizing data to get that. So at the early level, um, it's gut feel it, to a large extent. The, 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 the real thing is don't make any approach that tries to pretend accuracy at that early level because we know we don't have it, uh, and don't get things and things um, locked in. Don't don't make commitments. Don't make commitments about time at that level without re realizing the consequences, um, you are making a decision, yeah, we're gonna make forward, move forward with it. I mean, the, the approach I've also used effectively is to commit in smaller chunks, right? So, so make, make a decision, yes, we're gonna go forward with it, but we're gonna do so with, with a, a, um, you know, a, a first, first phase approach to it. So commit to smaller chunks and then, and then uh, look at incremental rolling funding. So these are all types of things that can be done at that level, but the uh, the detail estimates will be will be um, uh, miss, will be making us think we know more than we do. Great, Todd. Can we squeeze another one? We're almost out of time. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. One more. Yeah, one more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this one says uh, this one is by uh, Tala, and she's asking. Or so, I'm sorry. They're asking, how does the effectiveness of Little's law of forecasting change? when the number of teams is really large. You have a large number of teams, which means you have a right. large backlog. So how does that change? Yeah. yeah, so what you're looking at there is you're, you're aggregating. And the thing, also thing you have to look at when you have multiple teams involved um, is that that would be one of the assumptions of Little's Law um, that you do have to look at carefully uh, is that um, 
the the they all have to be behaving in a similar fashion, right? So if you you could have a situation where um, uh, you you have to be careful about trying to apply Little's law behavior in one team and apply it to another team. Each team is almost has to be dealt with independently. Now, if those teams are similar enough and behaving enough and you have the data that demonstrates that they're behaving enough, then you can aggregate them accordingly. But, um, you know, you might have a situation where one team is working on um, items, different type of items than another, and those items are not effectively not consistent units. So, so in this is a case where story where size might matter because if they're consistently higher on one team and consistently small in another team, uh, you won't be able to really compare those. Um, and and little law would say that you, you know you can't aggregate those. So it's um, you can do it if you just you have to figure out you know how do I how do I pull these together. Um, but I tend to we tend to start by looking at each individual team and how that's how that's progressing. Um, you can't, like I say, you might be able to aggregate, but if you are aggregating, just make sure that there's some some additional caveats you have to be cautious of uh, before doing that. And then, and then what you do look at is is just like in 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 this slide, you look at is how is my how is my committed backlog growing compared to my delivery rate. And, and am I on target to deliver and what decisions, um, what actions may I need to take in order to, to get the desired results that I want? Thanks a lot, Todd, for, the, for this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.